Well, a good part of what we're what I'm going to talk about tonight is actually going to have a lot to do with how people think and how people create. And a lot of the background relates to hemispheric dominance. I'm sure everyone's heard about the right half, left half phenomena. Uh, it is a, actually a very important background. A little bit more just about me so you understand why I think that I'm qualified to talk about innovation. I've had a 43 year career starting with a Bachelor of Science in General Engineering uh, from Cal State Northridge. And one of my very first jobs was actually the opportunity to work on what was at the time, the world's first optical disc data system. RCA had one that played video. We were creating one that played data. You could write to it once and read from it, something you're quite familiar with today. In that day, that disc was 14 inches in diameter. But we had to invent a bunch of things that weren't available at the time, the ways to focus, the way to track the laser beam, the way to keep it from reading the data despite defects and such. Um, there was quite a bit of innovation that I was exposed to, not by myself, but by others. So I got to see it from the bottom up. After that experience, I worked for a company that designed weapon systems. And that's where I got my very first patent. And from that, I created my own company with the help of my wife, which was a consulting company to design products and manufacture them for others. And through that experience, we got exposure into robotics and many other things. And I got my name on at least eight more patents. At present, my wife and I started up a robotics company, which is shifting over to become a life sciences company. But as part of that, we had to innovate a number of areas to be able to make the products interesting to the market and to bring value to the company. And so that's some pretty up close and personal uh, application of having to, to be innovative. Give you an idea of the range of things that, that my career has touched on. It's everything from handheld blood analyzers to solar trackers, 3D cameras, battery chargers for airplanes. Even in the lower corner there, you can see a coffee maker that went on the airplane. Um, robots, all kinds of things relating to medical products, uh, commercial, industrial, and some military. So innovation comes in a lot of forms, right? The tech industry and tech products often steal the limelight, but innovations don't have to be a new phone. Innovations could relate to how something is made, how you market it, or how you sell it. There's many different varieties. And these innovations can cause significant change in our personal lives, in our relationships, how we view the world and how the world views us. These things have tremendous impact. Successful innovations always bring value in some form, whether it's tangible or intangible. But as you see, as we go through this, a lot of innovation starts a cascade of innovation. And it's that cascade that is the magic. If you can create something that starts that cascade, that is the magic, and that's one way you know you hit on something very successful. Before I go on to something I forgot to mention, any questions or comments or things you want to bring up, please feel free to ask the question right on the spot. Um, I, I really would prefer this to be very interactive, and I would like to be able to answer the question while it's hot in your mind if you have one. Fantastic. Thanks. Um... Bob, we had a couple join, a couple more people join, um, Zuby and uh, Eric. So just real quick, wanted to say to you two, um, you may notice that this um, session is being recorded, but at the end result, we edit this will only be Bob and his slides. Um, so if you're able to, to turn on your camera and you'd like to, and you feel comfortable and you're in an area where you can do that, please feel free to do so. Bob, if we have time at the end, I would love to hear about that coffee machine for airplanes. Oh. That sounds very interesting. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> So everybody knows about the innovation of the internet, but I, I'm not sure that everyone really understands just what that cascade was that created what you know as the internet today, okay? So the uh, Wikipedia actually has a very good bit of history on this. So this is taken from that using them as a reference. This started way before these guys, but the first notable contributions to what led to the internet were by these three gentlemen, Harry Nyquist, Ralph Hartley, and Claude Shannon. And if you're an electrical engineer, you know these guys by heart. 
they created some fundamental theory back in the 20s and the 40s that every single electrical engineer up to my day used and still uses. These things are the, the core math to what, what is the communication process is going on. So for example, Harry Nyquist showed that with a telegraph system of all things, he proved what the fastest it was that you could send the dots and dashes through the telephone wires. And that theory today, the Nyquist limit is still well known and well used. And then a little company like Bell Labs came along and invented the bipolar transistor, which started a cascade of moving away from tubes to truly solid state. And then they invented the MOSFET transistor, which is a transistor that is capable of being made extremely small, much smaller than bipolar transistors could be. And that's what led to the density of chips that we use today. And then computer innovations took off between the 50s and 70s. If you're old enough as I am, you remember the days of sitting at a terminal where you were one of many people sharing a large mainframe computer that was multitasking between doing the tasks you gave it and the ones that the others were giving it. And this led to the groundwork for distributed networks. And then along came Bob Kahn and Vint Cerf, who set up and created the TCP protocol, which set one of the major underpinnings for the internet. From that, their business opportunities opened up for commercial ISPs to be born and start providing this service. And then Tim Berners-Lee, working at CERN, a research facility of all places, led the creation of hypertext and what is the start of the World Wide Web. But there's a very important story within a story here, and one that, that bears on what we're talking about today. And that's that of Harry Nyquist. This gentleman created some of the most fundamental theories relating to communications and servo systems and feedback systems. The stuff that, that he worked on applies still to this day. He also generated the math and the theory behind understanding the sources of thermal noise which is one of the major limits in any detector system. He did a lot of work on feedback systems. But while he was at Bell Labs doing this, the patent attorneys at Bell Labs had a mystery on their hands. They couldn't quite figure out why some employees were so much more productive than others. Some folks produced an awful lot of patentable stuff. So hard to believe, but these attorneys actually crunched data talked to a lot of people, crunched more data to try to figure out what in the heck was going on. And what they found out was that the common thread here was Harry Nyquist. So what do you guys think Harry did that made his coworkers so productive? Anybody got any ideas? Uh, shoot from the hip. Um, <clears throat> I'll say his drive and his uh, just the way he probably communicated with his fellow workers into being more productive, something along those lines? Your, the, your last item, that was the one. What they discovered is that every one of these people had lunch with Harry, and Harry was the guy they went to to try to get answers to the problems they were facing. And the thing that was most notable is that Harry never gave them an answer. What he did was he drew them out. He got them thinking. He gave them ideas of how they might consider solving the problem, areas they might go look. And this is a very important leadership thing. So although Harry's not known for leadership, his leadership in the area of helping spark innovation, to me, was actually very important and a great example of how to do it. So taking a look at some innovation, if you will, sometimes it's just like a new coat of paint. You take an old thing and you put new paint on it and everybody thinks it's great and they go off and buy it. So take paper clips. What would you think is an area that would make somebody want to create a new paper clip? That's not a rhetorical question. <laughs> can, you, can you repeat the question, Bob? 
why would you think somebody would think it important or valuable to create a new paperclip? Because the legal system was taking too much time and money trying to assemble paperwork and folders. Ah, okay, okay, that's good. But why would you take an old school paperclip and try to make a new one? To hold more content. So, okay, all right. It all depends on what your business strategy is, right? You can try to grow your market, as Greg was pointing out, or if it's a big market, you could try to get yourself a small part of it by creating a niche product. Or you can see this as a gateway to get yourself into the stationary market to attack other parts of that market. Or if you just want to experiment, it's not very hard to make your own paper clips and you can advertise on the internet and go see if you can create yourself a market. So let's, let's try a, a little experiment here. So let's imagine that all together here, we all run a huge paperclip company and sales are flat. There's a lot of pressure from the shareholders as is typical for any CEO, you either keep that company on a growth curve or you're out of here. So if we were to take the paperclips as they are, as you see them today, as what Greg described, how would you innovate in paperclips? You guys got any ideas? What people don't realize is there are 11 billion paper clips sold every year in just the United States. And if you go across Amazon and look at the price per clip, we're talking about a $300 million market. Yeah, it's not totally stellar, but there's nothing to sneeze at. But exactly what you guys were hinting at Look at the variety of paper clips now that this is bifurcated in, especially given the last clip, the black one, really isn't a paper clip so much anymore as it fits with what Greg mentioned, right? You have to be able to collect much larger and thicker documents. So you can see, right, by being innovative in looking at, at some demands of the market, it's not necessarily the market by itself, but it's how the market could be split into niches and could you own that niche? So here's another innovation. Anybody have a clue what this is? Believe it or not, this was actually the world's first mouse. It wasn't meant to be designed for the project that was being worked on by Douglas they were considering light pens and joysticks as other alternatives. What he was trying to do was to come up with a way to improve how humans interacted with computers. At that time, they were big, ugly monitors. You could only type characters. There weren't any real graphics. But the biggest problem was, as it scrolled to present the data, you had to linearly go through the scrolling in order to read out or interact with the data. What the mouse presented was a way to do nonlinear processing of large amounts of data, ways to solve complex problems that they didn't have before. And if you think about this, as soon as you had a mouse that you could move around in the display, guess what? You needed a larger and higher resolution display. This had to be one of the things that contributed to what made the display market grow. And it changed how we thought about problems. You no longer were thinking in terms of flat. You were thinking in terms of 3D and beyond. It was enabling an entire revolution on how problems were viewed and solved using a computer. This clearly was a contributor to an astonishing cascade of innovations that we all take for granted today. So, how do you get people to innovate? Well, I have an old friend, Steve Hauser. He used to run an industrial design firm. He did it for well over 40, 45 years. He designed products for companies across this country and on the other side of the globe. Almost every single large medical device manufacturer from J&J &J to Baxter and you name them all, he designed products for these guys. He knew how to make a shoebox look cool. He was that kind of guy. But I've sat next to him on the airplane and you know, 
He doesn't need any kind of pressure or stress from anybody to design something. He just can't help himself. And it's my belief that there's something in his brain that re releases endorphins when he feels like he's created something. Unfortunately, I don't know about for you guys, but I know for me that doesn't happen. <laughs> I need something to prompt the innovation. And there's many different ways to do it. And, and I'm not pretending to be any kind of expert. I'm just giving you one person's experience over the course of his career. But it's my observation that it's stress in some form that drives problem solving. There is good stress, and that would be having aggressive but reasonable deadlines. You don't have to invent something today in order to keep your job. But look, we got a couple of months. Can we figure this out? That kind of thing. But to be aggressive at it. Low, low level stress isn't gonna make it happen. It's gotta be something that really drives you to create. Another thing that could be other than deadlines would be that you feel that you're making contribution to success of the organization and possibly survival. I would not vote to use survival of the organization as a way to induce stress to make innovations because that's a little over the top and that can be the bad kind of stress in my opinion. Within an individual, it's been my observation that there are two very strong sources of stress that can create innovation. One is survival. I would never vote to do that. You should never have your job on the line, at least as in a leadership role, it's not my position to put that upon somebody. However, fear of failure in my observation has always been a very strong motivator for good innovation. And it's best when it's applied to goal-oriented people. They understand that the idea is to hit a goal, that goal relieves the stress. It's best when it's not about coming out as first place or being top dog necessarily. It's best amongst the team when it's instilled in a person that it's all about not letting down the rest of the team. We did an invention to deliver a, a small robotics element. And everybody in the company was highly motivated because we all had something to lose together. We all had something to gain. And the importance was the ability to help each other. And that turned out to be what motivated uh, Zachary and Tony to invent something we just got a patent on. And, and I'll touch more and, and describe that in greater detail later for you. So, the days of an individual person being a sole inventor only on something, they're long gone. Anybody that thinks that Steve Jobs actually created and invented everything that's in the phone, that's a bunch of BS. That ain't happened and no more than Elon Musk actually designed all the crap that went inside of their rockets. It's all part of being a team and it's all part of contributing as a team and showing leadership for your team. So speaking about the leadership role now, it's our job to manage and leverage that stress to make sure that it's all done in the right way, doesn't build up to be too much on the wrong side. And once you do that, it's my view, you can pull off some amazing things. I've seen it done where I was in a company that went from one person to 90 people in the space of a year. And we launched a missile in that time that hit the target on the first shot and every single person on the team, even the receptionist, they all played key roles in making that happen. So it, it can bring out amazing things in people. But the part that I value the most about all of this is how it contributes to making a synergistic team. And my philosophy has always been, the name on the building doesn't mean crap for the, assets we have, what fancy equipment, what tools or whatever. The name on the building means something because of the people. It's because of the team. They're the ones that make something happen. So you'll see throughout this entire presentation, my focus is on the team. It's about the long play to building something that's an engine that can do amazing things with fewer people, less money and shorter time because they work together with this synergy that just is really hard to reproduce. So 
if in a leadership role you want to spark innovation, you got to start with your marketing homework. Worst thing in the world to do is put your team together, point them at the wrong hill and discover that after you spent the money and the time, you're screwed. So always know your target market as best as possible. Know what their pain points are. People always tell you when you're making your pitch for fundraising or whatever, know the pain points. Well, you know what? Every single person in a company needs to know what the pain points are or they're gonna be inventing the wrong things for you. And one way to get that kind of info is always to talk directly to the customers. Don't rely on marketing reports from other people or surveys or any of that kind of stuff. You've got to be the one to talk to them. And one of the classic failures in this area, which I am guilty of for the early robotic stuff we did, is to remember it's not about you, it's about them. What do they value? What do they think? And from that, draft up a criteria for goodness is what I call it. It's not a spec. It's the way that you can tell an idea is good or bad in the market you're trying to apply. It's not an engineering spec, it's an outline. It's not about how to design something or how it's built. It's what features, functions, capabilities, touch, feel, smell that will make it sell. As my marketing person tells me, it's not about picking the exact steak to cook. It's about selling the sizzle before you make the steak. So creating and managing this criteria, this is all about the two halves of the brain. So most people know, and if you don't, the right hemisphere is the creative side, the left hemisphere is the logical side. It doesn't mean that a right half person does not have a left half side and vice versa. It just means that you, you kind of favor one over the other. You have more confidence in your logic than you do the emotion or vice versa. Some of the most successful innovations and inventions on this planet answer both hemispheres. You may buy a car because it has good mileage, but you're not gonna buy a car that's covered in polka dots because that's not what the commercials are gonna to try to sell you. So in establishing logical requirements, you need to put some realistic boundaries, right? You wanna put some hard limits on there if that came out of the customer interviews, how big, how small, how much it can weigh, what it can cost. But never forget, you're talking to engineers perhaps. And so you may say, hey, Scotty, I want you to be able to transport the biggest and smallest thing. Just don't forget to tell them that it's got to get there in one piece. These are usually the hard requirements for the size, weight, and cost. But for the right half, you have to try to express the things that are hard to put down on paper, but the things that came out of your market research, right? People always say easy to use. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means I could be a nuclear physicist, get an answer that a nuclear physicist would get, but it's explained in plain English with one button. That's easy to use. Another, another thing is to be able to create feelings of empowerment, right? How, how do you get that across to the folks that you want to design, right? So in some of the product development that we do, it's very clear that, that my customers they wanna be empowered. They, they want to be able to do things they couldn't do before. They wanna be able to do something without having to have the chemistry degree, but they can get the answer they need to know the water's got poison in it, or it's not, it's good. And another one that's often overlooked, which I think Steve Jobs did really well on, was to enable customers to innovate in the way they want to innovate because they know more about their business than you do. So he didn't necessarily know how everybody would use an iPod, but a lot of people did. And some of them listened to podcasts, right? And sprung up a whole different industry. So I know Henry Ford had a checkered past, some good and some not, but he did do some things that I think are overlooked. And I think it's important because it bears on what we're talking about. The old saying that, Henry Ford said that if I had given people what they wanted, he would have given them faster horses. But what he really saw was the future of horseless carriages. And Henry Ford was actually a very good salesman. 
he knew this wasn't about inventing the car. He'd already invented a race car and many other people were working on cars. What he did was figure out a way to create a market. And he recognized that in order to make those sales and capture that market, he had to hit a price point. Back in the day, a good horse and carriage, well, not even a good one, a decent horse and carriage cost you somewhere between five and $700 in 1908. The first Model T sold for 825 in 1908. And given the technology and the capabilities at the time, the fact that he was able to reduce that price by almost a third in the space of eight years is pretty amazing. So my bet is that Ford's innovation criteria to his team was reduce the cost of manufacturing, find new ways to reach customers and make sales. So credit goes to the employees, Clarence Avery, Peter Martin, and a few others, along with Henry Ford, they took a look at meat packing plants and grain mill conveyors and thought to themselves, wow, if we could do that same transporting of product, but in the production line to bring the subassembly to the worker, we could reduce cost and produce units faster. And everyone jokes about, well, you could have the Model T in any color you wanted as long as it was black. Well, the reason he did that is because black paint in the day had the capability of drying faster than the colored paints. Some of the original cars that Ford produced, actually you could get it in many other colors. So what he did along with that is he created a huge sales and publicity machine where he involved every single newspaper he could get their ads into. And then on top of that, he created a network of local dealers. And along with those dealers, he helped build and encourage the growth of local motor clubs. The man was a good salesman. It wasn't about inventing the car. So here's, here's something that I, I'd like to get your folks' ideas on. So suppose we have identified the lawnmower industry as a viable target. And we want to innovate. We, we want to capture a part of this market, right? So I went and looked at some pictures off of the internet here. And what, what I found very curious is even in our age of supposed boom of automation and robotics, I, I did a Google search and the lower right-hand corner picture of the automatic lawnmower was the only one showed up. And for me, it showed up on page three which is really curious to me. So clearly there's some sort of criteria going on with the users. If you were to create a criteria for goodness for a new lawnmower, what would you guys think would be the criteria that we should apply? I, I can tell you, I own three Roombas and uh, the only problem I have with them is the little bucket's too small. So if there was a way to innovate, a way to have it automatically empty itself, now, now that would be interesting. So, so the, the driving need here, I, or not need, I, the, the niche that I think the automatic ones fill is where people don't wanna pay for landscapers, but they don't wanna spend the time landscaping for themselves, right? So I would think anything you could do to add to time savings would be very valuable. Um, is the pollution aspect, I think is very important if you couldn't automatically readjust the sprinklers, if, if the mower actually told you that the sprinkler in the front right part of your lawn wasn't working, I mean, you know, mine go off at three in the morning. So for me to go find out which one broke takes a lot of effort. If this just prompted me, I would know before the grass died. Well, you could see how we created a little cascade there. And yeah, it's only for the mowers, but it's all about that interaction. And, and you know, I super appreciate that you guys are comfortable sharing these things out loud, that's often the hardest part of getting people to help you participate in doing um, what ends up being innovation. All right. So when, when I run innovation meetings, brainstorming meetings, as, as we have inside my own company, there's a number of rules that I follow and, and everybody has different rules. These are mine. 
Um, but number one thing is there is no such thing as a dumb idea. The, the only dumb idea you have is the one that you should not speak up. That's yeah, not on the map here. And so, you know, you, you got to get that across. You got to establish trust and that every single idea will be considered. And because we have this criteria for goodness written down, it helps you make sure that everyone is treated equal. There is no favoritism. Just because I have a title doesn't mean that my idea is any more important or valid than the others. And it's very important to get this across to the team, in my opinion. And like I said, every idea gets traded off against the criteria for goodness. But the one rule that I have that actually turns out to be kind of fun is that there must always be at least one crazy ass idea, one off the wall thing has got to be on the table. And I always kind of think back to when I was at uh, Edwards Air Force Base watching the first space shuttle land and they had to send it back to Florida. I so wish I could have been a fly on the wall when I was in the room, when the guy piped up and said, hey, let's put the shuttle on the back of a 747 and fly it back to Florida. I do not know who came up with that idea, but it worked. And who would have said that that wasn't a crazy thing that somebody would have considered? So it, it's always important to kind of try to push the boundaries and get people to break that barrier of, of whatever the idea is, if it meets the criteria, it needs to be on the table. So it's my experience again, that this never happens in the first meeting. It's gonna take multiple meetings. And as I'll show you in a second, I, I have firsthand experience that even the meetings aren't the one that make it happen. We have had meetings where people prepared in advance which is really valuable because it helps spark other ideas. And you wanna reward that by giving that first up attention. Somebody had the motivation to try to work outside, that's where the magic happens. And as a team, everybody gets to decide. Everybody contributes. It's a level playing field when you're in this, in this meeting. Um, and as long as you can defend your idea and show that it works against the criteria for goodness, it counts. What you're saying brings to mind the issue of culture, whether it be organizational culture or team culture, things like there's no such thing as a bad idea and creating a psychological sense of safety. Is it doable to create a more innovative culture? And if so, how does that happen? I've seen it in my career at companies I've worked at. I've seen it happen twice. It, there were amazing things happened with a really small group of people specifically because of company culture. And in, in my businesses, my company, um, culture is everything to me. And truthfully for me, it always comes down to just basic core values. I always tell people, even at the interview process, there's only one way to get fired, lie, cheat, or steal. It's pretty simple. And if you want to become a part of the team, you have to get the rest of the team to count on you. What Bob K thinks doesn't really mean anything. What matters is whether or not the rest of the team comes to count on you. That's That type of approach is what I have seen as what makes the difference. The problem is in my first two experiences, the boss lost sight of those values when it came time to get close for him to cash out. And his ability to cash out was dependent upon his horse races finishing the race. And he changed the culture from what we were just talking about to one of, I'll beat the horses until we get across the finish line. And if they die in the process, I'll just get another horse. Well, my experience is you're making the road a lot harder on yourself. I have 10 billion other things to do that have nothing to do with the innovation, but are key to keeping the company rolling. If I got to keep going back and servicing because I keep shooting my culture in the foot, I want the culture of people that they're all trusted and can innovate and do their jobs without me micromanaging them. So I, I think it's paramount, but I think it's 
it's state of the art, Mike. State of the art is not in any technology. State of the art is how we manage ourselves, regardless of whether it's a technology project or not. And people don't get it. Um, you can be in it for the short haul or you can be in it for the long haul. People want you to be loyal to them and they, as much as you want them to be loyal to you. And so it means setting a good example. And the hardest part about that is that's a 24 seven example you have to set. And, and you know, it's not easy and not everybody can do it. Some people do better than others. I mean, I've worked for people like Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and I'll never work for him again. Yeah, their organizations pull off stuff, but in the end, they only care about one thing and it really isn't you despite what they say. We had a, um, a customer who wanted us to be able to sort out these little teeny pins. These pins are super tiny. He wanted to be able to dump 2000 pins inside of a gadget that a robot could pick up a single pin in a very specific orientation and then place into that tray, you see. They were doing this by hand. He wanted to automate it. And so I gave the crew their criteria for goodness. We had to pick up one pin every 10 seconds. The robot had to be able to grab it in a very repeatable position. We had to be able to do 2000 pins in the time frame, but it also had to be quiet so you couldn't use a vibratory feeder and it had to fit on a desktop. So we went through the whole process. We had the brainstorming thing. People came in with cardboard mock-ups of ways that they would do it. I, I was astonished. The crew was just awesome. And we came up with what we thought was probably a good way to do it. It would require some band-aids and we thought we'd go forward. Everything was, was on the path. And then Tony comes to my door. He and Zachary had spent the night taking this little plastic cup. They filled up the cup with pins and that little dowel you see slides up and down with a little hole. And Tony showed me that he and Zach had found out that by dipping that post up and down at least five times, one of those times would always end up with a pin in that hole, always. That this was far superior to anything that came out of our meeting. And we ended up patenting this and producing that machine you saw in the video. So what it taught me was, it's not about the meetings. It's not about making the trade matrix. It's not about any of that. It's getting the team to ingest all of the information into their DNA to understand the criteria being empowered, being, being, as you pointed out before, psychologically comfortable to be able to go risk an idea and try something and then bring it and show it to the team. That's what I got out of this because those guys did it at night after all the meetings. And it showed me also that it takes time to create these ideas. So doing this whole process as early on as you can from whatever your deadline is, is super important. So as I mentioned, we got a patent out of that, it was very exciting. And the lessons that we learned. And, and last thing to touch on, kind of relating back to this company culture, the company culture is not about I, it's about team with a capital team, T. Capital team, that's right. <laughs> All right, so before we run out of time, I, I would like to touch on things relating to your IP that you create out of this. Um, there's a number of very hard, one painful rules that I have created. Uh, everybody does it differently, but these are my rules. Rule number one, always have an agreement between you and everybody for patents and inventions such that any and all IP gets owned by the company and they assign that IP to the company and you need to do this before you do anything. And this applies to everybody in the company, employees, contractors, consultants, the janitor. If your dog is connected with it and somebody happens to come along to represent your dog, you could be liable if you don't do it. I mean, I know it sounds funny, but, but let me tell you, I've been through a lot of things on the legal system 
And it just, you need to be really, really careful. Anybody that remotely is connected to this needs to have a patents and invention agreement that's signed. And rule number two is always obey rule number one. A few cautions about patents if you're not experienced with these things. You need to be aware that if you omit somebody as an inventor of the patent, that patent could be invalidated. If you add people to the patent who were non-participants, that patent could be invalidated. If you show anything relating to the invention publicly before you file, it's possible that you could be prevented from patenting or your patent can be challenged as having been disclosed publicly before you file the patent. So you need to be very careful. Rule number three, always have an NDA. Don't ever disclose it to anybody without an NDA. It's very important. And that includes yourself having an NDA with company that you signed along with everybody else. And the reason you need to have it as well is you need to make sure you set the proper precedent that the precedent is if you're ever dragged into court that you have made no exceptions about NDAs or um, uh, proprietary information inventions um, agreements. You need to be very consistent. If you incorporate a company as an entity and you don't treat it like an entity, the IRS can declare that it's not an entity and you can lose all the benefits of having a court. You need to treat these things very carefully and very strictly and very consistently. If you're in the creative process, you have an idea, but you're still trying to work through it. At what point would you start the process of trying to protect your idea? If you're gonna invent a new paperclip, I wouldn't talk to anybody about paperclips until you have an NDA. Because if you get dragged into court, there's gonna be a lot of hearsay and you need to show that you were very scrupulous, that that's probably the best line of defense that I can think of you would have as a, a non-lawyer. Every single person in my organization has signed an inventions agreement and that includes an NDA. One of the reasons is, is that the legal system isn't anything like you see on television. So if you haven't had any direct interaction with people suing you, or that sort of thing, um, let me tell you, it's not what you think it is. So you need to make sure you take all the proper steps to protect yourself. And of course, rule number four is always obey rule number three. And I'm sorry, but I can't say it enough. It, it is terrible as an entrepreneur to get started only to lose control of your ideas. So here's a painful part for entrepreneur, especially pre-funded. I, I know it's expensive. Sometimes you can get free legal counsel. Um, I myself would advise against it. I would not go to any of the online things for legal counsel. Um, they're good for basic research. Um, you can often go get info from them for some very basic forms and such. Um, but the problem is the laws change constantly and they're very different in each area. The laws gar guarding patents and patentability and ownership of software, for example, are very different and very separate from what they are for hardware. So for example, if you say you copyright software and somebody contracts you to write software, unless you sign an agreement that says that they own that software, there is an argument that they don't own the software even though they paid you for it. So you need to be very careful in whatever avenue you're going, going forward with, and you need to use legal counsel. I have watched many different inspirational speakers and all these other people, one of which who said, always be willing to have every problem you could have and have it only once. This is an area you don't ever wanna have it because if, if it does come up and you lose control of your idea and the other guy makes 100 mil off of it, you're gonna feel pretty bad. And I mentioned that already. Oh, uh, one thing one thing is important to mention. If you do secure legal counsel or a patent attorney, one of the experiences I've had that really opened my eyes is one of the vice presidents of the robotics company happens to be a patent agent. 
And so instead of having to spend 20 grand to write every patent, he writes these patents for us at, at bare minimum cost. But what he has brought to the table that I have gotten out of almost no other patent attorney is he helped us with IP strategy, not what to patent, but how to patent it, how to structure the patent, how to put the right wording in there, how to file continuations in part at the right time in the right way, how to use provisional patents over a formal patent filing. That strategy is as important as the patent. So whatever legal counsel you retain or whatever patent attorneys you retain, I strongly urge you to vet them properly and thoroughly to make sure they understand that they need to help you with a lot more than just writing the words of the patent in a way that the USPTO accepts. I didn't intend him to be a patent attorney. He, is, uh, he actually has a huge amount of engineering, manufacturing, and entrepreneurial experience. It just so happens that he's a patent agent. And so once he started writing patents for us, the amount of money that he saved us was astonishing. And the securing of the IP and the strategies uh, turned out that that, that that was one of the luckiest moves I ever made. I, I can't honestly say I did it on purpose that way, but it sure turned out well. All right, and that concludes the presentation. Any comments, questions, feedback? I hope it's useful um, and I appreciate everybody participating. Thank you.